Namaste, how are ye? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast, episode 166 and all. Newgrange and Angus Og. We're going to be telling that story in one moment as Surika will tell you all about the lovable little fella who is the god of love after all. Now look lads, this is the Mythical Places series, so we're going to go all around the country picking up on mythical places that you might not have heard about and telling you a bit more about them. So, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to candletales.ie and hit the PayPal button or to patreon.com forward slash candletales if you'd like to become a Patreon member. Thank you so much to those who've been reaching out, sending us messages, lots of love, grow more, kind of meal amagwiv. Untuk, it's fantastic. We love you. And also, you know what? I hope you keep well, even if you're not able to support us. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Here's a story for you. Here's Sorica. Tell us a story, will you? Newgrange, Bruna Boigne. Before it was restored, before it had that lovely white quartz facade, before you could see the entryway, the window box, all the parts of it, it looked like a hill that was a little too regular. And the countryside thereabouts was dotted with hills were a little too regular, surrounded by the river, the Boyne, the sacred river of the goddess that wound its way through this place of mystery, this place of wonder. People knew better than to tamper with Slee and Bru for it was the seat of Angus Og, the young son. And even though he was one of the two Adidanan, one of they who did not die, he was always young, always younger than he should have been. His mother, Boan. His father, not Boan's husband, Elkmar, but the Dagda, the good god, the High King of the Tua de Danon. And when Boan and Dagda had their tryst, they knew their love affair would be brief but passionate. It would burn bright and fade away. And so for the day that they lay together, the Dagda froze the sun in the sky. Elkmar thought the day a perfect one for hunting and stayed away, not noticing. And the only way that the passage of time was measured on that long, long, lovely day was by Boan, who conceived a son and carried him and bore him all before the sun went down. Of course she could not keep him, and so Boan gave her son to the Dagda, Angus Og, the young son. And the Dagda took their son to his good friends, Midir and Fulmnok of Brile. Childless themselves, they were a couple who were known to be excellent foster parents. And it was they who raised Angus Og as their own. And Angus Og grew up, loving his parents and beloved by them. He was a hard child not to love. Birds appeared when he smiled. Butterflies flew about his head. His golden hair curled. He was a delight. And he delighted in others. But at last the day came when Madeir and Fumnok had to take him aside and tell him the truth that he was not indeed their son. His parents were others. His mother was Boan, his father was Dagda, and Midir that day took him to meet the Dagda. By this time, it was not possible for Angus Og to meet his mother. His mother Boan had looked into the well of knowledge 
Noel had overflowed, pursuing her, and she had run so fast she had become a river. But the river wrapped around her seat, her hall, her home. And when Midir brought Angus Og before the Dagda, the High King of the Tuatha Dé Danann, the Dagda took his young son aside and said, "That place is your inheritance." And your mother would want you to have it, and have it you shall. And the only obstacle was Elkmar, because of course Elkmar had inherited the brew after Boan became a river, and he would not be easily persuaded to give it up. But the Dagda was the good god, because he was good at everything, and he had a plan. He told his son to wait until Samhain, until that day of the year, when custom and indeed law dictated that no guest could be turned away, that every guest who came to any household could ask for a favor, and the favor must be granted. And the Dagda instructed his son well, and at Samhain, Angus Og set off for the brew. Now when Elkmar opened the door to this young, beautiful man, he did not know who he was looking at. But he immediately didn't like him. And this beautiful, arrogant youth smiled at him, expecting to be invited in, and it was even more galling for Elkmar to remember that it was Sawin and he had to invite him in and so he stood aside with a bad grace and Angus Og then said I'd like a favor of course a favor could not be refused on Sawin not without inviting doom and so Alkmar gritted his teeth and asked his guest what he would like he knew full well he could be asked for anything. His finest drinking horn, his best cloak, 50 head of cattle, anything this young man wanted, Elkmar would have to give him. Most did not abuse this rule, sacred as it was, but Elkmar had no trust in this young man's good sense or his decorum. He had a bad feeling. And the feeling got worse when the young man said, I want to stay here at Bruna Boigne for a day and a night alone. But Elkmar could not refuse a reasonable request. And when he looked at it, it was a reasonable request. It was inconvenient. It was galling. It was highly irritating. But it was not entirely unreasonable. And as the king of the brew, he couldn't be seen to be petty or small. And so he agreed. And he and all his followers left. Elkmar made sure that they left, taking everything with them that might make Angus's stay comfortable. He had his servants carry out all the food, all the drink, all the soft furnishings. And although he did not say it out loud, he wished the young man an uncomfortable day and a night, with nothing to eat or drink, no cushions, no blankets, no hangings on the wall, just the cold stone of the brew. And Elkmar and his followers camped out by the riverbank, the river that had once been Boan, his wife. Elkmar took little comfort from it. It seemed to him on this night that the gurgling and the lapping of the waters sounded like laughter, a particular kind of laughter that his wife had had and she thought he was doing something foolish, but didn't want to tell him what it was, 
because she thought it was funnier to let him find out for himself when he ran head first into the consequences. And so he spent a fitful night. And the following day, he waited until the hour came at which the young man had presented himself at the door the night before. And Elkmar went and knocked and said, all right, you've had your fun, get out. But the young man refused. He stood there, smiling, and said no. And Elkmar was so shocked. The door was closed in his face before he had time to react. But he was king, still. And he could not be seen to overreact to this young man's silly prank. And so he calmed himself. Rather than attack the youth with armies, he took himself to the High King for legal recourse. And he appealed to the High King of the Tua de Danon and said that a young man had come into his home and was refusing to leave. And the Dagda, the High King of the Tua de Danon, asked Elkmar, what exactly did you agree to? And Elkmar told him, I agreed to give him the brew for a day and a night. And the Dagda stroked his chin and his eyes twinkled. And he said, ah, but Elkmar, there's a thing about time that you've never understood. It's in a day and a night that all time passes. The wheel of the year is but a day and a night, and light years follow dark. And so, if you think about it, all of eternity is held within a day and a night. And so, when you gave that young man your house for a day and a night, in truth you gave it to him for all of eternity. And it's his now. And so Angus Og became Lord of the Brew, became his seat. And it was there that Angus Og dwelled with the birds that flocked to him, and the butterflies, and the people as well, who came just to be near him. And he gathered to him the beloved dead to bring them there to a resting place before they went back into the world again. He made it his home, his shining hall. Elkmar, though, was not finished with Angus. For a year he plotted, furious at how he had been tricked. And perhaps a suspicion grew in his mind. Perhaps he had noticed the glances between his wife and the High King. Perhaps he was putting two and two together. Especially with that little dig the Dagda made about Elkmar not really understanding time. But he came up with a plan of his own. And the following year at Samhain, he went back to the brew. Now at that time, Midir, Angus Og's foster father, had come to visit him. He missed him terribly. The house was not the same without him. It seemed quiet somehow, even though Midir and Fumnok had at any given time 50 foster sons and 50 foster daughters. Still, Midir had the feeling of a man with an empty nest. But Angus was delighted to see him, and Angus made him so welcome. Midir stayed longer than he'd intended to. And so he was there at Samhain when Elkmar made his move. They were outside the brew, and they were looking down on the valley. And they saw a hurling match. A huge hurling match. Three times fifty youths and maidens in a scrum. And it was getting exciting. And it was getting intense. And then something turned 
and what had been a game began to be a fight. With the players wielding their hurls like cudgels against one another, an Angus Og made to set off down the hill to break up the fight, but Midir stopped him. Because there, standing on the hillside opposite them, was Elkmar, watching them. And that put a worry into Midir's mind. And so he told his foster son to stay where he was, and Midir himself went down the hill, carrying no weapon because, of course, it was Samhain and no weapons could be carried. And Midir waded into the fray. And it wasn't weapons that they were wielding. It was hurls. Sporting equipment. But the youths, the hurlers, who indeed had been set up by Elkmar, they were ready for the man who came down the hill to break up the fight. Thinking it was Angus Og, they turned against Midir and beat him. And hurls of ash might not technically be weapons, but they can be dangerous. And they knocked Midir's eye out of his head. Angus Og was horrified. Elkmar was furious and frustrated. But Midir had lost an eye, and the loss of an eye would mean the loss of his kingship. And so he was wounded, not just in his eye, but in his heart and in his mind and in his soul. And he was furious with Angus. Angus healed Midir and offered him whatever he wanted. Any gift he could ask for, even the brew. But Medir asked instead that Angus Og bring him the most beautiful woman in Ireland. And it was the fulfilment of that bargain, of that gift, that led to Medir meeting Atain. And that is another story. Elkmar never won the brew back from Angus. It remained his place. His place to gather the beloved dead in his shining hall. For after the two Adedanin left the world of men and went under their hills and their palaces, it was said that the insides of those hills, those mounds that were too regular to be natural, those were their holes. And they did not miss the sky because the roofs were set with gemstone and glittered more brightly than day. And there they held their feasts and their revels. And there Angus dwelled. From that day to this. podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan and Alan Holman. You can find out more about us on our website, candlelittales.ie. And we're on all the social media, so like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Candlelit Tales, or send us a message to get onto our mailing list. For more videos and live streams, like and subscribe to our Candlelit Tales YouTube channel, which now has a Candlelit Tales for Kids playlist, hashtag Candlelit Tales. Liking and subscribing to our channels really helps us grow and get to more people. And if you're able to give us more direct support, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one-time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We also do really like to hear back from you with any questions, requests or comments, leave them in the section below. If you want to find out about our courses, anything like that, just drop us a line. And we especially appreciate you listening.